I flew over my house on a couple of weeks ago. Massive. Massive. Fill the sky, did. Made the earth move. Yeah, piece of kit. It's the Vulcan. This is the inside story about one of Britain's best loved aeroplanes and its final flying days. The Avro Vulcan was the plane that protected the nation. A Cold War icon designed to launch a massive nuclear retaliation at the Soviet Union. Today, only one airworthy Vulcan survives. But now too expensive to maintain, this technological masterpiece is about to be grounded forever. Well, it's 30 years past retirement, so we can't say with 100% confidence that it's gonna run swimmingly. We're in unknown territory. Towards me, Guy. Guy Martin has been granted privileged access to help prepare the aircraft for its most ambitious mission ever a 1,000-mile farewell tour of Britain. Oh oh, 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 brilliant. He'll experience the rare honour of flying in a Vulcan formation. I reckon I could have jumped onto the Vulcan. I just, I could have, I could, that's how close it was. And he'll become one of the few civilians to ever take control of a military aircraft. You have control, my champion. Vulcan nuclear bombers were scrambled from places like this. Robin Hood Airport near Doncaster is a former RAF base. Of the 136 Vulcans built, only one is left flying. This is where she lives, in her original 1950s Cold War hangar. Oh, we love a new project. We love a new job. We love a new job. Designation XH558. <laughs> Name the spirit of Great Britain. That's a lot of playing. This is the first time Guy's seen a Vulcan up close. Look at that. It's just massive. It's the size of the sky. 45 tonne as it sits here. 93 ton when it's full of fuel, 14 fuel tanks in that, 14 fuel tanks. No, it's quick, nearly, not quite, but nearly the speed of sound. It's like 700 odd mile an hour. That's a lot of plane work. The Vulcan was a remarkable leap forward. The concept was dreamt up in 1947 by Roy Chadwick, whose other celebrated bomber, the Lancaster, entered service just five years earlier. Going from a Lancaster bomber to this in the space of five years is like nothing. It's like no, it's, it's nothing like. You could say, you might say that it's a quantum leap. I wouldn't use that word. I haven't thought of the word yet that I'd use. But this is just, oh, you know, one of those moments. <laughs> Who's that? I've come up with that. It's one of those moments. Look at it, hey? Handled like a fighter. But then, could drop massive nuclear bombs. There are four busy months of air displays to go before 558's final flight, and Guy starts work by reporting to his new boss. We've heard a lot about Taff. He's Welsh, isn't he? He's Welsh. <laughs> I should have known that. Kevin Taff Stone is 558's chief engineer. How are you doing? All right, Taff. Good to meet you, I'm Guy. Uh, pleased to meet you. So what's the plan, then? This is the man responsible for keeping the Vulcan flying way past her sell-by date. So if a wing dropped off this, it's your fault? Yes, in the court of law I could be culpable for it. Oh, heck. And go to prison. It's on his head that he'd go down for five years. And so before Guy is let anywhere near 558... So we are actually on a live, active airfield. Taff insists on some essential training. Health and safety reduction. 
I am a first aider, so if there's any problems, I can deal with all that lot. And obviously, we don't get drinking drunk. No, I'm not very good no. at that, boy. But that doesn't matter. If it means to get the chance to work on a Vulcan, then I'm all for it. Taff is a highly experienced former RAF engineer. He worked on Vulcans for 30 years and flew with the Red Arrows as the back seat technician. They are live ejection seats. Right. So if you're... 558 is his pride and joy. <laughs> this is temperamental, high maintenance, but they're going to do liver. It's a proper engineering aircraft. You, there's no little black boxes to tell you what's wrong with it. You get to know and feel the aircraft. That's our induction. With the induction over, work can begin. Yeah. That's all that might Take the weight. Up you go. The first job is a big one, testing 558's engines. Yeah. Go on, what's happening? Sure. Taff enlists Guy's help for the first crucial stage of the operation. One handle, six doors. <laughs> Away we right, go. I'll get cracking then. Come on. That's, that's it. That's it, excuse me. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Six tonne of door. Yep. It's filled with ballast, the bomb blasts. Is that right? Yeah. That'll do you, Guy. This servicing procedure is performed every 20 flying hours and has been carried out since the Vulcan entered service 59 years ago. Today is the final time it will ever be done while she's flying. The companies that sign off 558's annual safety checks have run out of the necessary 1950s expertise. So at the end of the year, the permit to fly will not be renewed. I'm not particularly looking forward to it. You always want to be the best and you want to keep it going right to the end. And then you're thinking, but I don't want it to be the end. You just want to keep going, keep it going for as long as physically possible. That feels like falling in a chasm. It's built to fly, and yet they're getting rid of the best British bomber ever built. Something wrong somewhere there. OK. This is a jet engine to start the jet engine. We're clear behind Sam. When the Startmaster's on, ignition is on. OK, air is on four, buttons in. Once started, each engine is checked at full power. Sucking in 100 kilograms of air a second creates the Vulcan's legendary howl. Rounds went well. Sat him down, zero fuel. Take some beating that, boys. Take some beating. Thanks, everyone. All complete. Everything went well. All right, the ground's shaking. But as well as the ground, it's like my innards are moving inside me. Oh. I, one of them, I've never felt anything like that. But yes, test passed. We're one step nearer to a final flight. It's going to be emotional. This breathtaking aircraft was designed and built entirely in Great Britain. It was the first British machine of the atomic age. And yet it started as a humble doodle on a newspaper. When World War II ended, the Cold War began. In the face of an increasingly belligerent Soviet Union, Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee commissioned an atomic bomb program to act as Britain's nuclear deterrent. This left his Ministry of Supply with the problem of how to deliver that deterrent. They tendered for an aircraft capable of carrying a five-ton nuclear payload to Moscow in less than three hours, flying twice as high as anything that had gone before in order to avoid Russian defences. A.V. Rowe of Manchester rose to the challenge. Technical director Roy Chadwick realised conventional straight wings wouldn't be up to the job. Instead, he suggested a radical triangular delta wing. Obviously, it's great for lift. 
because we've got a massive amount of wing area. It makes the whole fuselage very stiff because it's all joined together in one lump and we've got loads of area for storing petrol. Or fuel, we'll call it fuel. Chadwick's original doodles became designs for a plane built around a bomb. The five-man crew were almost an afterthought. You need to have a look in it. Is there any light? Will this camera be able to see that? She's cosy. She's cosy, mate. Right. Yeah, what we've got here is um, that's the pilot, number one pilot. That's the co pilot. This is me on the stairs. And there is no space. You could not swing cats around in here. Here we have AEO, Air Electronics Officer. He looks after all the planes, electrical gummings, and there is a lot of electrics on this. Um, nav Plotter, he looks after where the plane's going. And here we have Nav Radar. He looks after dropping the bombs. See this in the corner? See that? Manual bomb dropper. Hey, that is a powerful button. So you're thinking, right? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, and that's your um, your suit warmer that took 90 minutes to warm. It recirculates the air in the engine bay to warm that up. 90 minutes. <sighs> You've broken me. You've broken me. But she is busy. I press the button. In the early 1980s, the Vulcan fleet had reached the end of its serviceable life and was sliced up for scrap. But 558 was given a stay of execution when she was bought by a private enthusiast. In the House of Commons this afternoon, Mr Jonathan Aiken will announce the sale of the Vulcan XH558 to Mr David Walton. <laughs> Do you know how much he paid? Got the original mag and the original advert. Anyway, in 92, he paid £25,000. You know, you do think that initially, £25,000, get a Vulcan bomber for £25,000, great. But then you've got to think, how are you going to explain that to the missus? 558 was now a museum piece. But five years later, in 1997, a Vulcan superfan had other ideas. I said to myself, I'm damned if this aircraft will never fly again. Sends a shiver down my spine even now. Robert Fleming, keen air cadet, nuclear physicist taught by Stephen Hawking, and pioneer of computer networking at the start of the World Wide Web, gave up his executive salary to try and restore 558 to flight. It was an immense personal risk. Some of my old friends of the time thought I was mad, <laughs> which, to be honest, was, was one possible explanation. I regard this as the Everest of aircraft restorations. It must be. And I have to admit, at times, I was wondering whether or not I was going to be Mallory or Hillary. I do think there's an engineer's gut feel that I certainly feel. From the very earliest days, I was convinced that we could return the aircraft to fly based on instinct rather than actual firm knowledge. We thought we'd need about one and a half million to restore the aircraft. That proved to be a huge underestimate. The project was on the brink of financial ruin, and as a last resort, Fleming spent three solid months preparing a submission to the Heritage Lottery Fund. This is it. This is two volumes worth uh, 110,000 words of what is needed to make a successful lottery fund grant application. A pretty reasonable novel. They were awarded £2.7 million. Public donations more than doubled that figure. And in 2007, after 100,000 man hours, the world's most complex restoration was rolled out of her hangar. 
558 was towed past her adoring public, taxied to the runway, made the familiar howl, reached 116 miles per hour, and flew for the first time in 14 years. The plane has been a star of air shows ever since. There has been a cost. I guess I could have earned very much more money than I've earned. I'm not sure whether or not the stress has caused medical problems or whatever, but there have been a, a few milestone medical issues along the way. Undoubtedly worth it, no question. We've given so much pleasure to so many people. It is a dear job to run. How much does it cost? I don't want to, you know, you don't really ask. But I thought I should ask. The figure that we have had to raise year on year is about two and a quarter million pounds. Two and a quarter million. Well, we can take the aircraft to the people. We're seen by somewhere between two and three million people a year. And in my head, that's a pound a smile. The Vulcan is funded largely by public money and displays for around 40 hours a year. The maintenance alone to keep the plane safe runs up an annual bill of one million pounds. None of the servicing jobs on the Vulcan are straightforward. Checking for airframe fatigue requires the plane to be jacked up off the ground. But lowering it back down again is one of the riskiest procedures the team carry out. Guy will have to pay attention to everything Crew Chief Taff tells him. Right then, let's get some work done. It sounds a bit dramatic that we say if you let one jack down too fast, you write the whole plane off. But that is the case. Once the wing supports have been removed, the aircraft is left sitting on hydraulic jacks. 45 tonnes of priceless aeroplane is balanced on just four small jacking points. If you come down incorrectly and it slips off, then it could completely ruin the aircraft, or it could twist the airframe. Oh, heck. There are no spare airframes, so a twist here would leave the aircraft permanently grounded. Guy will work alongside former RAF technician Ray Watts. We keep our eye on Mark. Yes. So our two come down together. Yes. And the guys come down together and we just stop. Yeah. And basically, if any doubt and you're not happy, we shout stop. Yeah. And all four of us will stop. Yeah. I cut my teeth on these when I was 18 to 22. It's a bond that stays with you. It's going to be a sad day when the last flight goes. You'll see a lot of people upset. And I don't really want to talk about that day. OK, all together, down one. Guy slowly releases the valve, and the painstaking procedure begins. You think oh, that, that's pace or a bit? That's fine, so we just keep our eye on that one as well. Just yeah. watching by. Taff was sat in the cockpit watching a plumb bob. So Taff knows if it's back end too low or front end too low or cross cornered. You know, that's when it's going to stress the airframe, you see, so everyone lets the jacks down evenly. OK, front's only down one. Front's yeah. only down one. OK, stop. You can hear it creaking. You hear the airframe creaking hole. Nobody panics, and Taff guides the fractional correction that's necessary. Front right only, down one. The plumb bob returns to centre. Stop. These boys have done this before. We're in good hands. Thirty-five minutes after starting the process, the Vulcan has descended 18 inches and is safely back on solid ground. Way off. That's it, we're done. We have to have the Vulcan off jacks, mate. Spot on, mate. I'm impressed that they trusted me with the, with the knob on the jack. But he was all right, he was all right, we got it done. Thank you, cheers. Yes, we'll cheers, boy.
The Vulcan's radical design relied on a number of complex electrical systems to help it fly. Although commonplace today, when the first prototype was built in the 1950s, they were completely untested. We've got no fancy computer programs back then to tell us if it's going to fly or if it's going to do this or do that. We need to build one and then get a pilot daft enough to fly it. That man was the debonair wing commander, Roly Falk. Roly, of course, was always dressed immaculately in his grey pinstripe suit. And he said an aircraft should be as clean as a car. It shouldn't be necessary to put on protective clothing. <laughs> in August 1952, Falk stepped forward to see if a full-size Vulcan would fly. It had taken five years to reach this point. Avro designer Stuart Davis had developed the Delta concept and witnessed the maiden voyage with his daughter. I was 12 years old, and down we go to stand with the other bystanders. Great anticipation. Clear to taxi, runway 26. He teased us a bit because he took it on one or two little test runs down the runway before he actually did anything. 698, Woodford Tower, clear for takeoff. And then this beautiful bird took off into the sky, and we all thought, wow. It stopped the whole of Cheshire, the traffic, everything, ground to a standstill, because he'd never seen anything like this at all. God, it was only about a space. It came over the new assembly here at Woodford, and he rolled it like a fighter. We couldn't believe it that such a massive aircraft could be rolled, and he smashed all the glass in the roof of the new assembly, and it was like that for a long time, until the roof was redone. I've never forgot that. All the workforce thought it was terrific. He did put the aircraft through a lot of manoeuvres. They weren't always manoeuvres that he had been asked to put it through. And I can remember my father saying he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but it just shows how good the aircraft was. <laughs> Rowley, of course, was a superb pilot, but being a superb pilot doesn't really ensure that the aircraft is ideal. It's absolutely vital that the aircraft can be handled by the worst pilot in the squadron, if you like, and not only the best. So before the plane was handed over to the RAF, brave pilots like Tony Blackman had to test it to the limit. In the Vulcan, it was always particularly exciting because you would lose control at the maximum speed. It, the aircraft would just try, try, try and die for home. Avro spent four years refining the design, using as much cutting-edge technology as possible. From analyzing shock waves in wind tunnels, to early computers. Calculations which would have taken a month can now be condensed into a matter of minutes. Well, that's what was so amazing about the Vulcan. In spite of this very unfortunate handling, we managed to make it into a very effective bomber. The Vulcan entered service in 1956, but its smooth shape influenced the design of stealth bombers some 30 years later, and its Rolls-Royce Olympus engines became the heart of Concorde. My father was extremely proud of it, and every time I've seen it fly since, uh, tears come to my eyes, I think of my father. We have visual. Guy Martin is about to see one of the final displays of the last airworthy Vulcan the legendary nuclear bomber. Can you see the sound? See the sound? It makes that noise between 85 and 97% throttle. They didn't design it to do that. It just happened that it's the air rushing through the engines, down the tunnels. You know, it's like a resonance. It's like blowing over the top of a milk wall. I don't know if you can hear that. We just opened her up there. The howl, you feel the howl off that. The only thing better than experience in a Vulcan display from the ground is to watch it from the sky. The Blades aerobatic team have flown alongside 558 on numerous occasions and are marking this 
their final display together by inviting a Spitfire to join the formation. And Guy. All right, mate. He'll be flown by Miles Garland, one of the Red Arrow's youngest ever squadron leaders. Don't be shy, my mother wasn't. So what's the craziest thing you've done? What's the craziest thing I've done? Yeah. Um. Just seconds after takeoff, guys within a wingspan of the Vulcan. It's a bold statement, but I don't think there's anyone that's got any nearer to a flying Vulcan than, than me and Miles. I reckon I could have jumped onto the Vulcan like a bloody. You know, I just. I could have. I could, that's how close it was. It was going that slow, it looked like it was going to fall out of the sky. But it wasn't, it was doing 180 miles an hour. The Spitfire is 20 years older than the Vulcan, yet is still nowhere near retirement, which begs an obvious question. There's a load of Spitfires flying. Why can't the Vulcan carry on flying? She's not as simple as our mates. Because the Spitfire, it's cables, rods, linkages, you could build it in your shed. But the Vulcan could not be further from that. It has 14 miles of cabling, more than 100,000 parts, and with no manual overrides, if there's a system failure, it can't be glided to the ground. With the engineering firms who guarantee her safety now running out of the old-fashioned skills needed to support her, 558 has to be retired. Vulcan's going to accelerate away now, Guy. You might want to film it. Perfect. Look at it go. Hey. <laughs> yeah, that's the flying with the Vulcan complete. Mega. Perfect, guys. Thank you very much. Now I'm probably the last person that's going to get as near as that to a flying Vulcan. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> You've done that before. <laughs> oh. Well, that's never going to happen again, is it? I've just all went to mush. I've just, I just, I've just been sat the whole time just gazing at the thing. <laughs> just gazing at it. I'm still shaking my head. You, you give me a minute. Give me a minute. Have a, have a cup of tea. She may be a crowd-pleasing display aircraft these days, but the Vulcan was designed to be a killing machine. At the height of the Cold War, it was a linchpin of Bomber Command's QRA. Scuttle, scuttle. QRA stood for Quick Reaction Alert, a special group poised to rapidly deliver a massive nuclear retaliation in the event of a Soviet attack. Every Vulcan squadron had to have a plane loaded with a nuclear weapon ready to go at a moment's notice, 24 hours a day. Whenever that call-out occurred, it certainly sent the heart racing. We tended to sleep in our flying suits. The essence of the thing was to be able to move quickly and to get your aircraft quickly. We knew if we were ever scrambled, it only meant one thing, and that was missiles incoming to the UK. We also knew by the time that we probably got east to Norway, there wouldn't be much left of the UK, so it was a case of we're going to do to them what they have just done to us. One of the things you had to come to terms with is the fact that it may well be that you would result in the death of hundreds of thousands of people on the ground. Not a nice thought. And it's somewhere I wouldn't like to have gone. But if I had to have done it, I would have done it.
Back at 558's hangar, the maintenance work continues. Guy's been entrusted with a turbine inspection deep inside the air intakes. I thought I was going to have to get doused up in duck oil before I get right and get naked to get in, but actually, she's, she's, it's all right, there is plenty of room. You don't know what's going to crack next or what's going to drop to bits next, so you've just got to have a keen eye. Any nicks in the blades, that's what we're checking for. Can you see what I'm, can you see what I'm looking at? The torch. If there's been any rivets go through or birds go through or small children go through, it'd mark the blades. You hear that noise? Just the blades are loose in the root. When the thing gets to temperature and at speed, like the centrifugal force holds them tight. That's how they should be. If they're not rattling, we've got a problem. Thursday morning, sat an air intake in a Vulcan, eh? The best mechanic's job. The best mechanic's job, eh? I don't want to scratch or anything, but... Spot on. Spot on. Everything in order, as far as I can see. We'll get cracking. Done here. It's one of the tasks we have done. No task is complete until Crew Chief Taff records it on the Civil Aviation Authority's Certificate of Work. Yes. If you'd like to sign for a physical task on this aircraft. Spot on. Great That's job, it. mate. Thank you very That's much. you on the official paperwork, so I know who to blame. It's all in hands. Don't worry. 558 is fit to fly for now, but there's one safety aspect that has beleaguered the Vulcan through its entire life. Whilst the pilot and co-pilot up front had ejector seats, the design couldn't accommodate them for the crew in the back. But what they did do for us is they, the seats would swivel and then we have what's known as a seat assister cushion. Right, I get into that position there. I pull this lever on the side, which inflates that cushion there like a whoopee cushion. And you cannot fight it. If it goes off, it ejects you towards the entrance hole. Of course, uh, there is a disadvantage that if you've got the undercarriage down, then just aft of the uh, the escape hatch is the nose wheel. Um, that front wheels are staring at me. It's not going to do your dentures too much good. I've got to somehow get down there and jump that way while avoiding that, while trying to pull my parachute. You what? The way you had to go down then is you went down with your legs spread apart, so your feet slide down the outside of the hatch onto the hydraulic jacks, and then you reach over and catch the starboard jack. Starboard? What side is starboard? And you swing yourself out the side of the door. Um, hang on, I've got my shield caught on there. Hopefully to go down the side of the nose wheel. I've got... And now pull my parachute and try and miss that. Even if the nose wheel wasn't down, an emergency exit was perilously dangerous. Not terribly satisfactory, and not a lot of people have actually got out. 15 Vulcan crashes, all in all, um, and in 10 of those crashes, all of the boys coming out that way died. 10 of the crashes. Odds aren't very good. I can see why. <laughs> One rear crew member who had to contemplate those odds was Peter West. I heard this bang. Well, it was a bird strike. The two starboard engines burst into flame, and for the first and only time in my RAF career of nearly 35 years, I pressed the key and sent a mayday message. The plane was 558, the Vulcan guy is working on. People have said to me, oh God, 558 nearly killed you. Con on the contrary, 558 kept us alive. That aircraft with a big hole in the starboard wing stayed airborne. There are two months left before Vulcan 558's 1,000-mile farewell tour of Britain, with the team confident the airframe is holding up well. But she's 55 years old, and with no other Vulcan having flown for so long, the team never know when a problem might arise. And on the 5th of September, one did. At the controls that day was Virgin Atlantic Airline pilot, Bill Perrins. 
we performed a couple of air displays and we were preparing to land at Preswick Airport up in uh, Scotland and we selected the undercarriage down and it didn't fully come down. A plane spotter's footage captured the faulty nose wheel. A safe landing looked impossible and with fuel running out, the airport initiated its emergency protocols. Phil Davis was in the back of the Vulcan, working as the air electronics officer. We believe that some air had got in the system, so the nose wheel came down to about uh, 70 degrees. We called if there was any British military aircraft around. The RAF scrambled a Spitfire over to us. Can you give me your speed, please? I'm just on your right-hand side. So the Spitfire came up, flew alongside, and confirmed that the nose wheel was, in fact, not fully down. It looks like it hasn't we have just kind of settled to go out to sea to blow the gear down and suddenly I think the old girl decided that she uh, didn't want us to do that and with a big clunk the nose wheel went down and locked. The nose wheel was down but nobody could be sure it would take the strain of the landing. Perrins kept the nose in the air until the last possible second to try and make touchdown as gentle as possible. She'd made it, and for the pilot at least, it's definitely time to retire 558. Personally, I think it's exactly the right time to knock it on the head and park it up. Uh, certainly when I reach uh, the same sort of comparable age, I don't want somebody to make me do lots of things I don't want to do. I just intend to sit in an armchair, become grumpy and drink a few beers. Thanks very much to everybody for your patience and help. Well done, Volker. There are only five pilots sufficiently qualified to fly a Vulcan today, and aviation regulations prohibit carrying any passengers. So there's only one way Guy can experience a working Vulcan. This is XM655. Although not in flying condition, it's preserved well enough to be able to taxi fast. Guy will be allowed to experience this from the cockpit, sitting alongside Wing Commander Mike Pollitt. Right. Morning all. Morning. Welcome to our new student pilot, Guy Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mate. I ask, mate. <laughs> Normally, there's four and a half months of solid ground school and then four or five trips before a co-pilot is let off on his first ever real go with his own crew. So this is going to be considerably compressed for your training today. Happy? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to take off? Do I? Yeah. She does. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd lose every licence possible, you know, and I'd be in court. And the Civil Aviation Authority would take me to the cleaners. Would it be um, worth it? Well, it would be with you on board, basically, you know. <laughs> These boys would like it. You know, I would, I would look it. The intention is to lose speed just before takeoff by using the wing as a giant air brake, which means Guy having to follow a very precise set of instructions. You're going to sit in the right-hand seat. Yes. Which is the co-pilot's seat. OK. We will show you a few of the switches that need to be made on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. And I'm specifically going to point out the airspeed indicator. Yes. And so that's going to hit 75 or 80 knots. Right. OK. At that point, we'd close the throttles, pop the air brakes out, raise the nose, and that presents the wing to the airstream. To slow it down. Yeah, that slows it down. Have you started a jet engine before? Have you started a jet engine before? No, definitely not. Good thing you know. Good God, this is going to be an honour to teach you how to start an engine. <laughs> no, never. Never. Eric, clear start four. Clear four. Lighting up now. There she goes. Uh, that's got it. Open her up. Yep. OK. Yeah, you're doing it by feel. Fantastic. Well done. You've started your first jet engine. <laughs> you're clear to remove the chops and everybody clear, please. Okie dokie. We are clear to move. Just ask him if I'm clear to enter the main runway. Clear. Put your hand on the stick. That's my boy. 
this is the ASI the yep. speed indicator. Keep half an eye on that. Uh -huh. If you notice anything untoward, you let me know. Only briefly taxiing at full power is permitted, but it will take all of Guy's concentration to help Wing Commander Mike Pollitt keep the Vulcan on the ground. Is everybody happy? Thumbs yeah. up in the back, no problems. And we've been cleared to go. Okay. The engines are brought up to power. Five seconds. Go. <laughs> She's got some lift. <laughs> At 90 miles per hour, they pull back on the stick hard to try and slow down. The nose soars. <laughs> Just before takeoff, they slam the nose down. I think that was a little bit more than a wheel. The air brakes are deployed. They stamp on the wheel brakes. And bring the 70-ton bomber to a halt. You relax, lad. <laughs> Not a lot of room for error. I can hardly read the speed off fast enough. That's some acceleration there. Guy's experience doesn't end there. You have control. Thank you. Britain's newest co-pilot is entrusted with taxiing this priceless aircraft back to base. You've got the rudders and the nose wheel steering and the throttles. The hand brake's still on. Yep, brake's off. Yeah, you can hear a bit of power. I always check to the side. That gives you a feeling of the speed as well as checking that your wheel tip is clearing any obstacles. About 20 miles an hour, think. More like 30 now. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as good as driving a Scanyol, isn't it? Which is the same, just the same. Watch this camera, we've got somewhere on the centre line. So keep a little bit to the right, guy. Okay. I'll just bring around gradually what I say to the right now. Well done. A bit nervous. <laughs> well, that was pretty good. A 70-ton Vulcan. Boy, a natural at it. <laughs> okay, stop. Yeah, okay, brakes apply. Fantastic. Engine anti-sync off. Can you close one and four, please, guy? That's the outers. That's those shut now. Yep. So close two and three, please, guy. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> that was slick. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. So what's the captain's opinion on the newest recruit to a Vulcan squadron? He's good. He was really good. I'd say, you know, if we did that three or four times more, I'd let him do the next one himself. Really that. Very, very good. Vulcan pilots were always rigorously trained, but it looked like they or their aircraft were never going to see combat action. By 1982, the Vulcan's time was nearly up. Then, just three months before retirement, the tired old bomber was finally called into action. Argentina had invaded the Falkland Islands. Their tanks were on the streets and their aircraft had captured the key strategic location of Port Stanley Airfield. Britain wanted to take out the runway so it couldn't be used by Argentina's fast jets. But the challenge was using conventional bombs to hit a target just 40 meters wide that was 8,000 miles from home. Even launching the attack from the halfway point at a base on Ascension Island still meant this would be the longest bombing raid in British military history. We're away from any coastline, so we can't use our radar. So we went for a long period 
where we really didn't know where we were, apart from we knew, of course, we were heading south. The Vulcan would need more than 30,000 gallons of fuel to complete the mission, but its tanks could only carry 9,000 gallons. The only way to get fuel that far from home was with a relay of 11 airborne tankers and a bafflingly complicated in-flight refueling plan. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. I didn't really understand it, couldn't follow it. But luckily, I had Dick Russell on my right shoulder, and I turned to him and said, do you understand that, Dick? Uh, and he said, yes. So, oh, thank goodness for that. Refueling is very, very tricky. The object is to, with small throttle movements, you gradually edge up to put your probe in the basket of the hose. Easier said than done. The pilot's explanation for in-flight refueling was it's like trying to put a piece of wet spaghetti up a cat's backside. You sweat, uh, not half sometimes. Sometimes you'll run into turbulence, which will make it even more difficult. It is stressful. I know there's so much that could go wrong. I mean, if you speared that into the back of the plane in front, he's probably going to come down. That's going to break off. That's going to go in your engine. You're probably going to come down. Yeah, it could get messy, but then we like a bit of risk. And they didn't just have to refuel once. They had to refuel seven times. But after the final top-up, the crew realized they'd been left short. They were now beyond the range of any other tanker. If they continued the mission, they'd be unlikely to make it home. Martin thought about it. I can hear him now. He said, I haven't come all this way to go back. I was absolutely determined that we just had to go on with this attack. Running into the target at 400 miles per hour, the bombing computer was switched on. A 1940s clockwork calculator that worked out the bombs should be released from two miles away. It is genuinely mechanical. The forward throw should carry the bombs to target. Mind-blowing. The mission's success now fell to Bob Wright. It's a matter of pressing the button so the bombs start falling off the aircraft. Finally, the counter gets to 21. I said, bombs gone. Out of a load of 20 odd thousand pound bombs, only one hit the runway, but that was enough to put the runway out of commission for fast jets. So the job was done. And today, 33 years after its finest hour, it's time for the last Flying Vulcan's farewell tour of Britain. But after months of planning, the whole event may have to be cancelled due to thick fog. Can you see? Can you see out right? No, you can't. That's the problem. You can't. Hoping for the best, the team decide to prepare their beloved aircraft for flight anyway. It's four months since Guy first joined the ground crew to help them work on this iconic machine. What will get me is what it means to these boys, and when it starts to hit them, it's going to be emotional. Yeah, it's like a friend. Feels sick. All the memories of the thing. What's this going to mean to you when it packs up? Like? There's a bit of all of us on that, and that's the thing. We'll be upset when it dies. It's had emotional. I'll yeah. say that much, yeah. Only crew chief Tuff seems to be keeping a cool head. No. Just good at hiding it. There are three hours of pre-flight servicing to carry out. The pneumatic systems are replenished. Anyone have thought done this before? <laughs> the tyre pressures are checked, and 558 is filled up with fuel. Where Where you you me? Sorry, sorry, mate. Where do you want? Right. Up. Turn it up. It takes 40 minutes and costs 24,000 pounds. An hour before the scheduled takeoff. The fog begins to clear. 558 can be handed over to her pilots. What's the plane mean to you? 
Well, it's about the 63rd time I've flown it in the last five years, so it's got a place in my heart. And it's just, you know, I, I know you like machinery and the technology in it. The more you learn about it, the, just the more fantastic the design was. So, yes, we'll miss it. Captain Bill Perrins runs Guy through the mission. We're going to go whoosh across to just west of Harrogate. Yeah. And then up toward Newcastle Airport. Oh, yeah, you are having a ride. Yeah, and around, then eh? all the way up the northeast coast, just to the east of Edinburgh. Yeah. And down through the Lake District, which is going to look lovely today. Shouldn't be too bumpy. How Point. low are you going to go over here? 500 foot? 501 feet. And then... Uh, <laughs> I like the man's precision. And then we're going to fly... Over Woodford. Over Woodford. The airplane was born at Woodford. Yes. Nottingham, Derby, and then back here and land. And that's that. I would. Last time ever. Very sad. So we need to get in the airplane and go flying. You've got yeah. to feel alive. Don't press the tower, Falcon. Don't press the get up in here. No, request engine start. Engine's turning light up. Everybody happy? Good yeah, taxi. Okay, just waiting for Tark and his magic wave. There he is. It's happening. I'll be happy when she takes off, because then I know we've all done our job properly. Five Five Eight is about to start her most ambitious tour ever, where she'll cover a total of more than 1,000 miles. It brings a funny emotion, actually. There'll be people around the country now who will be seeing this for the last time, so it's a, it's a funny old moment. Rear crew member Phil Davis makes sure the epic tour is flown with military precision. OK, we're five seconds late now on our front time. Okay. The first landmark is the Cold War radar station at Menwith Hill. Oh, yeah. Fans with camera phones are at every turn. Oh, brilliant. That's a lot of people here, actually. Yeah, it's a loser, John. <laughs> Flying above the Yorkshire Dales at 250 miles per hour, the Vulcan soon reaches the River Tyne and is cleared to fly over the centre of Newcastle. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of happy, uh, a lot of happy buddies down here. <laughs> One hour after takeoff, they reach the Firth of Forth and Edinburgh's famous hill, King Arthur's Seat. It's quite a spectacular-looking city from here. It is, isn't it? It's remarkable. Mm. The question is, how long is it going to be before I have to eat that sandwich? Don't we normally have pies? With more than 50 locations to visit. The last flying Vulcan was getting the send-off she deserved. The Vulcan was something special. There's nothing like it left. There's not going to be a dry eye in the house, I can guarantee that, and certainly not in my head. To see 558 finish flying is going to be a sad loss to me. I'll always remember it with huge affection. It was, to me, the best aircraft in the world. I loved it. He's flying beautifully. This is what's so sad. He's going to be mourned. The tour was a magnificent success, with 300,000 spectators turning out. General, you know, the old Concorde final flight didn't get this at all. No, I don't think it did, did it? I was there. The Lake District saw huge crowds on the shores of Windermere. Oh, yeah, I can see it now, right in front. There's a whole bunch of people waving flags. Beautiful. She flew past Manchester in its police helicopter 
and onto Woodford near Stockport, once home to the factory where all the Vulcans were designed, built, and first flew. Okay, She went on to complete a tour of the south as well, taking in the Severn Bridge, the White Cliffs of Dover, and the Thames Estuary, before finally returning to Doncaster, where XH558, the spirit of Great Britain, will live on the ground forevermore. I hope you've enjoyed it. I, I hope you learned it. something. I've learned a lot. Well, it's regular, isn't it? It's so designed over here, built over here, and then eventually it was restored over here. What an achievement. Keep him coming, keep him coming, keep him coming. Uh, let's grind that in as actually. I was pretty nervous when I was lollipopping it back. It's a lot of playing coming towards you, that. Hey, there's only going to be one winner. Good marshalling there. Marvellous marshalling. It's been a massive experience. Met a lot of interesting people, a lot of people with a lot of passion about this plane. And that's made it great. I hope you filled your boots because that's it. That's it. She's never going again.